My topic will be the interpretive legacy of Kiwama. So um, the conception of gender rights in Islamic scholarship and legal thought is nowhere more evident than in rules that uh, classical scholars, jurists, and commentators devised in understanding marriage. And one point most often raised to prove the absolute superiority of men over women is undoubtedly the, the Quranic concept of trauma. In the popular imagination as constructed by scholars and sustained by all lay Muslims alike, it has come to signify husbandly hegemony and assumes that the Quran and assumes that the Quran has definitively decreed this power of the husband over his wife. And for most, this should be read as a mandate crystallizing the authority of all men over all women at all times. This is one of the most flagrant misconceptions to have shaped the Muslim mind over the centuries. The concept of Qawma, as we understand it today, itself does not actually appear in the Quran. It is derived from the term Qawamun, with the root Qawma, which in Arabic has as many as 30 definitions, including to stand up for, defend, rise up, comply, take on, provide for, protect, uplift. The word Qawamun and its derivative Qawamin, referring to the successful performance of the act of Qawma, is found in only three Quranic passages. However, the best known and most often cited verse that supposedly justifies the superiority of men is, this, is the following. Verse 44, I'm pretty sure we're all quite familiar with it. Um, Al-Rajalu Qawamun ala an-nisa. Men have Qawamun, authority over women. The other two verses that mention th th this term is, oh, is this one. Verse 4135. Um, o ye who believe, kunu Qawamun, stand up firmly bil Christi for justice as witnesses to Allah. And verse 5 8. O ye who believe, kunu qawamin, stand up firmly, lillahi shahada bil kisti, for Allah, as witnesses to a fair dealing. So before looking closer at the first verse that invokes so called male authority, let us first analyze Kawama as it appears in these two verses. Most commentators agree that verses 4 1 3 5 and 5.8 urges believing men and women to uphold core values such as justice, fairness, and equality, all of which are a running theme in the Quran and therefore represent the central tenets of Islam. In both verses, we find the same injunction. <coughs> Be righteous and precise in your testimonies to ensure justice. In verse 4, 1, 2, 5, Kunu Kawamin Bil Kisti, be firm and rigid and rigorous in your implementation of justice. The Quranic insistence on this value of fist of justice demonstrates the necessity for a morality that respects the equality and humanity of all beings. This kuwama, this obligation to unconditionally and unwaveringly safeguard justice is the major exhortation in the Quranic message. This is the true meaning of the term Qawaman, which stipulates an ethical consciousness that is steadfast in defending human dignity. We must then ask ourselves how exactly did this Quranic sentence, Al-Rijal Qawamun ala al-Nisa, which is part of a larger verse 44, in its turn part of a larger passage and part of a larger structure of governing principles, became an independent and separate patriarchal tool used to promote injustice by consolidating men's power and authority over women and abuse to maintain this hierarchy. It raises more concern when we locate the verse to this Quranic chapter, which starts with a very clear establishment of the intrinsic equality of the sexes, <coughs> from which, through revering God, mutual rights are extracted and revealed precisely to their prophet to foreground this equality that transcends the realm of belief and must translate into the running of everyday life. 
Reverence God, who created you from a single nous, self, created of similar nature its mate, and dispersed where from countless men and women. Reverence God, through whom you demand your, mu your mutual rights. The Quran repeatedly makes no distinction between the cosmological equality and practical and practical in, and practical equality that should be no dissimilarity between the theoretical spiritual equality of the sexes and the manifestation of this equality in practice. The later the latter verse has been the crucial unequivocal verse which lays the foundation for the Quranic principle of gender equality, describing ideal male and female believers as fundamentally people who help each other, Aliyah, allies of one another, on equal terms, defending the common good, al ma'ruf, and fighting against the bad, al munkar, towards what can be understood from this as the overall progress of society. This very much corresponds with the, with the vision of Solomon in verses 4135 and 58 as well as the Qur'an's constant insistence on treating each other with dignity, which exhorts believing men and women to preserve and secure justice. That, in itself, is a hallmark of Islam. So we must address this obvious disconnect between these values of justice and equality promoted by the Qur'an, of the Qawama for justice, and the dominant translations and tafsir, or commentaries of verse 434, which rendered the word kawamun as a divine favor bestowed on husbands, indeed on all men, to subjugate women. Such oppression evidently goes against the very Quranic principle of, of justice. Yet, verse 434 was unquestionably the verse in which the whole model of the family in, in Islam was shaped. This verse was seen as a commandment conferring on men virtually absolute moral and material power, whilst women are expected to be tamkin, sexually available, and kwanita, obedient to this masculine authority in return for napaka, or financial maintenance. This ties in with the logic of the marriage contract, which defines marital relations as a legal structure of gender reciprocity, where sexual excess, access became a man's right, and sexual submission and docility was a woman's duty. These are some examples um, of commentaries by uh, some classical um, jurists and scholars on women, on wifely obligation. You guys can read it. I don't want to read it. <laughs> a woman who refuses herself to her husband and leaves his bed is cursed by the angels until morning. Uh, a woman who a woman should always give herself to her husband, even if she is on the back of a camel. When a man calls his wife to fulfill his needs, she should go to him, even if it, even if it was uh, on the baking oven. Even if a man were covered from head to foot with weeping sores, oozing pus, his wife is obligated to come to him and lick his sores. <laughs> Consequently, it has become common to read in certain villages common to read in certain religious writings that characterize the religious salvation of a woman as entirely conditional upon her husband's pleasure and approval, that a woman owes her husband the utmost degree of blind, unrequited respect and servitude, and her spiritual status is solely dependent on whether she pays these dues. This disturbing tradition conveys a rather powerful message that to please God, women must first and foremost please their men. There is an unjustifiable nexus created between God and men in that we have now juxtaposed the supremacy of the former to the latter. And this patriarchal 
cosmology outwardly contradicts one of the founding principles of Islam, namely that we submit only to God, and submitting to anyone else besides God is individually considered an act of shirk, the greatest mortal sin in Islam. This parallel between man's relationship with God and spousal relationship questions Tawheed, the unity of God in which his presence must always remain as the highest focal point, a major notion on which the whole spiritual dimension of Islam rests. Nonetheless, Kawama and its corollary Ta'a, obedience, never mind that the word Ta'a itself has never once been used in the Quran to describe marriage or prescribe wifely obligations but it has facilitated the proliferation of a whole religious literature that devalues women and has hindered the, judi the, judi the, sorry, the judicial and social implementation of the liberating spirit of the Quranic message regarding women and their status in marriage, the family, and beyond, whilst predestining men to be naturally superior to women. <laughs> Here are some examples of the plethora of such arguments found in most classical commentaries. No people will prosper that has delegated a woman to lead their affairs. Men are naturally endowed with more reason than women. Women are deficient, are deficient in reason because of their excessive emotionality and their tendency to resolve problems by emotions rather than rationality. Only men hold positions of great political and, ju and juridical responsibilities such as high command, governance, and magistracy. Only men are qualified to lead prayers, give Friday sermons, and act as witness, or give the call to prayer. Prophethood is only for men, never for women. Men make war and have a right to the spoils. Men's share in inheritance is, is double that of women. Men give dowry to their wives. Men are endowed with greater physical strength than women. Men can be women's guardians, but never the other way around. Polygamy is one of men's rights and proof of their superiority. Unilateral divorce is men's exclusive right because women are unable to make sound decisions and they are his property. Men are better equipped for seeking, for seeking knowledge and science. Women's inherent weakness is a natural attribute due to their physical and biological makeup. Men have the privilege of mind and better management because women's disposition is determined by humidness and coldness unlike men's dryness and heat giving them the characteristics of oversensitivity and weakness. Is that classical stuff? Uh, yeah. So mostly from Al-Tabari, Al-Qurtubi, Al-Razi. Where, where the verses are referring to humanity mm -hmm. as a whole, Kamamun is translated as maintaining and protecting equity and justice, a virtue both men and women are required to continuously apply in their interactions with each other during their lives on earth, which is considered a basic spiritual dimension of the Quranic ethic. However, when the subject matter refers specifically to women and men's obligation to them as a group, as per verse uh, 434, the meaning of Kamamun seems purposefully distorted into an edict that bestows on men the tashrif, honor of unquestioning authority rather than the taklif, or responsibility of not misusing the privilege they have as men. Kuwama by extrapolation became synonymous with pasalut, or meaning familial despotism, the term that we can actually find in numerous classical scholarship on marriage and traditions around the command to ta'dib, or physically punish women for nushuz challenging the power of the husband. If for the interest of continuity, and one must never approach Quranic verses in isolation, but rather with careful attention to its full scriptural context and internal cohesion, if verse 434 had been interpreted in a similar fashion as verses 4.35 and 5.8, in which Qiyam is understood as being firm, or consistent in defending justice and the equal worth of all human beings. What follows then is that men should be held to a higher degree, not over women, but rather to maintain and protect their rights. This, the verse effectively positions men as having, as bearing a greater responsibility to uphold the rights of women and warns them against abusing their privilege over women by observing that such privilege exists. 
bima fadal bima fadal Allah ba'dahum ala ba'di wa bima anfaqu min amwalihim for a bounty of advantages have been bestowed on men on one over the other women for the part the original direct meaning of bima fadal refers to providing financial support this suggests that the privilege or bounty stated in verse 44 is a specifically economic one thus an admission that men earn significantly more than women if they were earning anything at all in the society to which the Quran was revealed and also societies today considering the persisting gender wage gap and inequality in employment when we put the verse in context and we read it in light of other verses and concepts relating to marriage as described in the Quran such as mawada wa rahma companionship and compassion and compassion sakina peace and ba'dahum awliya ba'din mutual help we see that men's karma over women was not additional power given to men by god but rather a duty to safeguard this concession granted to women regarding the financial expenses of the family this corresponds to the subsequent verse 45 46 in which the quran stresses on the responsibility of the rich to spend part of their wealth and income on the poor to alleviate their hardships and eliminate poverty in the long run. Men are thus also encouraged and expected to do this with their wives, in this case perhaps, until women's full economic emancipation is achieved. And just as the Quran repeatedly emphasizes that this moral responsibility does not make the rich superior to the, to, to the poor, so it must be between men and women. The spirit of the Quran is encapsulated is encapsulated here in the importance of securing the, con uh, the conditions for protection of the most vulnerable, including women in certain circumstances, such as when they are unable to sufficiently provide material security for themselves, while stressing that dependence which might ensue should not be grounds for exploitation and abuse for that directly opposes the Quranic aversion towards any form of subjugation and oppression. Kuwama was thus accorded to the husband at the time the verse was first revealed, not because of their gender, but only in their capacity as manager and financial maintainer of the household. Debatably, this may suggest that if the, if the maintenance function were to fall on the wife, as is often the case in modern societies today, she should be the one to exercise kawama. Thus, no male exclusivity is involved. This would actually be strongly supported by a literal reading of the verse where there is no gender specification. If there was, the verse would have been Bima Fadalu Bima Lahu Ba'dahum ala Ba'dihina. God has favored men over women. The original verse has no um, gender pronouns in it. This specification of gender is an addition to the various translations of the verse that came later on by classical and contemporary commentators. The material in responsibility incumbent on men is about household management and is specific to this particular part of marital life. In order to deconstruct the semantic confusion surrounding men's kuwama, we must first limit it to the conjugal household Building on these earnest understandings of verse 44, the restricted meaning of providing financial aid has been applied to a wider range of generalized status of all men everywhere and at all times. From a relative changing condition of material bounty to an un unconditional favoritism based on gender, this juristic and exegetical construct of Kuwama, developed initially in the context of the marriage con in the context of the marriage contract thus provided the rationale for other disparities, such as men's rights to polygamy and to, and to unilateral repudiation, women's lesser share in, in inheritance, discouraging women's active pursuit of knowledge and formal education, and preventing women from occupying positions that entail leadership, the exercise of control, and autonomy in society. The concept of husbandly kawama having been the basis for abusing women in the private sphere and effectively legitimating, placing legal and or social restrictions on women's participation in the public, therefore played and continues to play a central role in institutionalizing, justifying, and sustaining gender inequality within our communities. 
to dissolve the bearing that this Kawama postulate has on public life, it must be made specific to marital life. Secondly, having done that, we should analyze and interpret Kiwama within the normative framework of conjugal relations in keeping with the Quranic ethic of marriage. It is impossible to reach an, an objective explanation of the verse about Kiwama if we do not take into account the whole Quranic text and all of the verses concerning women which stipulate equality and establish a dynamic of female autonomy that was unthinkable in the social context of the Prophet's time. Kuwama should therefore be read in reference to gender relations alongside notions such as ma'ruf, meaning common good, which occurs numerous which occurs numerous times in the Quran as an injunction addressed directly to men in their treatment of women. So all of these verses uh, pose to men to treat women with respect and dignity and uphold justice. Perhaps it is worth noting that Kiwama is not mentioned at all, as opposed to the number of times the term ma'ruf has been mentioned in the Quran. And the term kawaman, from which Kiwama is derived, is mentioned only once in regard to marital relations, and with a very specific purpose of designating material responsibilities as incumbent on the family's primary income producer. Yet, Kiwama often invoked as a textual basis for the assumed normativity of male authority and hierarchical gender roles has taken greater precedence and a disproportionate importance in our discourses compared with Ma'ruf, which seems to be sidelined if not completely absent in, from any literature. We should also read Kiwama together with other verses that concern family life, such as those enjoining husbands and wives to share responsibilities and mutual health. Dr. Hum Awliya Ba'din, verse 971. To harmony and joint consultation, Taradi wa Tashawur, verse 2233. And particularly to reciprocal love and tenderness, Mawada wa Rahma, verse 3021. This is not a relationship of competition, violence, strife, or hierarchy. It is impossible to have those values in the family unless these start with the fundamental relationship between the married couple. In place of competition, we must have cooperation. In place of domination, we must have partnership. Another key Quranic obligation to consider is that of adl, or justice, which is extolled throughout the revelation as an indispensable precondition for all human relations. Thus is the importance of restoring and relocating the concept of kiwama as it is derivatively used in the only other two instances in the Quran verses 135 and verses 5-8. The Quranic insistence on this value of justice demonstrates the urgency for a morality that fundamentally recognizes and respects the equal worth and dignity of all beings. This does not align at all with the Kuwama postulate from verse uh, 434 that sought to establish a marital structure built on the subordination of women to consolidate male authority. Such was the Prophet Kuwama who dedicated his life in fighting against this misconception, who practiced in his daily life what he had learned from the spiritual message, among other things, that equality before God necessarily implies equality between his creatures, men and women, in everyday life. So um, yesterday I was watching this show uh, on TV. It's called um, The Sunnah the Better. And it's a lecture series. Uh, the speaker was on. He kept emphasizing on the importance of modeling ourselves after the prophet. But the thing that struck me the most was that was the fact that he focused entirely on the most minor things that the prophet did. So, for example, he said like, because the prophet loves um, pumpkin soup, then we must try to learn pumpkin soup as well, or that. Because the Prophet hated um, to skip rocks, we must learn to skip rocks as well. Not once did he even passingly mention the Prophet's treatment of women. And the Prophet treated women with respect, with dignity, with love. There was this, there's this one story. Um, he was having a discussion with a man, and this man's son came. The man, put, uh, the man kissed his son and put him on his lap. Later, his doctor came, but the man barely even acknowledged her. So the Prophet turned to him and he asked, why did you not show the same love, the same 
devotion to your daughter as you did to your son. So even in something as small as this, the Prophet preached equality. And if you would look at other stories of um, the Prophet uh, and how he treated his wife, you, you would find that his husbandly kawama was about uh, his service to the family. It was not authoritarian, let alone despotic. As um, stories here, when Aisha, the Prophet's wife, was asked what the Prophet would do in his house, she answered that he would serve his family, and when it was time for prayer, he would get up and pray. He, so he never made his wife cook for him or um, clean up the There's this other story where um, one of his wife, I'm not sure which one, when he came home and saw her uh, kneading bread, he immediately took over and told her that it wasn't her responsibility to do that. In another narration, um, Aisha said the prophet would always do sim simple everyday tasks such as sewing clothes, mending vessels, milking animals, and meeting other family, meet meeting other needs of his family. So we must address this dissonance between the Quranic message of justice and reproach against oppression and established interpretations of Kiwama that has only further injustice and used to justify oppression. Reclaiming Kawama from these dominant mythical constructions of gender relations in the popular Muslim imagination, which seek to perpetuate outmoded stereotypes that keep hierarchical power relations intact, is crucial to disabusing, disabusing ourselves from the notion that God placed women under male authority. Against this background, hopefully we can now turn to the project of pushing forth an egalitarian redefinition of marital and gender rights within an Islamic framework that is in line with the Sunnah and the Quranic insistence on safeguarding justice and striving towards the common good in which gender equality is inherent. That's it. Thank you.